but I think that's a true pod camp spirit is to release the workshops as podcasts. So that's what I like to do. So anyway, I think this topic is why buyers are changing. We are all publishers now. And my other title for the session was buyers are changing. Sales and marketing must change too. So I can talk about that a little bit. I guess in some ways this is sort of a a bit of an advanced content marketing session, but in I think it's really more about just thinking about that topic from a different angle. My next session that I'm doing after this is there's some... Hi, welcome. We're just now beginning, so you didn't miss anything except the title of the session, which you already saw. And we don't know who you are. I don't know. uh, Yeah, and my name is John Reed, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about myself here in a minute. So I am recording this session. I'll take out anything totally off the record or confidential, but I like to share it as a podcast. After this session, I'm doing another session, which is sort of related, which I call Beat the Attention Economy with Expertise and Community. And the subtitle of that one is The Power of Deep Work Over Social Media Addiction. So you're welcome to stick around for that or not. I see them as somewhat related, but this one's going to be focused a little more on buyers and why they're changing across industries and what we should do about that. And you're all welcome to participate and and ask them any questions you have about that. I want to throw this back on you. What do you think about that statement? Buyers are changing across industries. Agree? Disagree? Absolutely agree. Right. And how, how would you describe that? Um, let's start with the downfall of brick and mortar. For instance, Staples store chain 10 years ago was 1,700 stores. Now they're down to 1,200. They're closing more every year. The company was doing poorly on the um, open stock market, so now they've gone private. That's just one store chain. All the rest of them are decreasing their footprint as well as decreasing the number of stores that they have because people are going online. They might go out to the store and say, I like this, and they go out home and find it in their size or find it at a better price, or they just don't bother to go to the store. Right. I agree with that. I find that people are just looking for the best deal, and, and so they they try it on, and then they order on, on the Amazon. <laughs> right. I don't think people have the time to go to the brick and mortar anymore. I mm-hmm. mean, all of us are struggling to find time. Mm-hmm. And so we shop at night, just before we go to bed, or we that's true. first thing in the morning, if we have a minute. It's mm-hmm. um, And I personally realized that the other day that I was doing this, so I thought I never would be, because I just don't have the time. And not only that, mm-hmm. I use staples. We do have staples here. However, when I think of all the retail stores I used to go to, and I'm a lot older than anybody in the room here, they aren't even here. If I want to get something at so and so, I got to go online. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's not just that I have changed. I was being forced to change. So it's a little bit of a reaction, reaction, action, reaction. That just keeps right. Building. There's some really interesting stuff in the retail sector, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what I do now. But I've written a fair amount about retail, and the other thing that's happening from a consumer standpoint is when people do come into stores. A lot of times they have done extensive research on products. They know exactly what they're looking for. And it's creating a lot of challenges for retailers on the floor, right? Because their associates aren't necessarily up to speed with the more sophisticated questions that people have in mind when they do come. If you can even find a store associate. And of course, then you have issues of minimum wage and turnover that are exacerbating those problems. I'm moving in on the fifth year of a company that I co-founded called Diginomica, and we look at digital change from the vantage point of what large companies are trying to do to reckon with the issue of sort of the future of technology and work. And so we look at everything from workplace diversity to artificial intelligence, but primarily focused on larger companies. Um, It's a bootstrapping startup. It's me and uh, my co-owners are four British dudes, so I'm learning a lot about UK culture and lingo, which is good. We look at these issues from the vantage point of in larger companies that are working on projects, the buying process is is, is very complex usually. They might evaluate over a period of months. It's not as simple as like say, you know, shopping for a voice recorder on Amazon there. It's a more complex purchasing process that I'm sort of referring to in this session that I look at. But I think these things are affecting 
suppliers pretty much across all kinds of industries in different ways. And so we can maybe talk a little bit about what that means. A lot of times this lingo that I use for this is the informed buyer because it seems like putting impulse purchases aside, I think consumers are more informed about their choices. And they're also, and I can run some stats by you. I don't want to like get too bogged down in stats, but uh, for example, uh, Gardner put out something a while ago saying that 68% of the buying process is conducted without the involvement of the software vendor that's in my industry. So starting to lose control a little bit with the early stages of the buying process. I think with smaller businesses, some of you may have encountered this, the rise of peer review sites have become very significant. Um, and even if you're selling stuff on various marketplaces, the reviews that you get become a huge factor in how people assess what it is you do. So purchasing becomes more social as well. So I guess one thing I wanted to sort of ask you about is, and what I think is really interesting is, a lot of times traditional marketers think, well, okay, there's this buyer, now I need to target them. But do you want to reach just the buyer or do you want to reach the community around the buyer? It's a really interesting question. What do you think? community. Why do you think that is? Well, word of mouth is such a powerful way of mm -hmm. uh, marketing your business. And so, you know, social media is just inundated with materials and images and links, and it's hard to keep track of everything. So if somebody personally comes to you and says, I love this organization and here's why, or I love this product and here's why, you're more right. likely to go check it out. So that creates an interesting marketing problem, right? Because the classic marketing is you identify a persona and you target that persona. But in fact, what I'm finding in my research is that in most industries, you want to reach a community around a person, including them, but the people around them as well. And that means you might want to connect with people that might never buy from you, right? They might be influencers, they might not be in the buying segment, but they might be respected by those you buy. They might be relatives or friends, to your word of mouth point. They all become part of what you're trying to reach. And then there's one more conceptual stage there, which is, should I be marketing to the community or should I actually, should my goal be to become a part of the community? As opposed to marketing to them, should I try to become a part of the communities in which I serve? And then you go from there, you start to ask a very interesting question, which is how do you do that and how do you create value for those people? Because the best way to become a part of a community is not by obviously blasting stuff to them, but by sharing things that make a difference in their lives. And so that's how we arrive at this point of the goal of, of reaching the new buyer has something to do with gaining attention and it's got something to do with being respected within those communities and part of what you might call trust networks. It's a little bit of a cliche, but this notion that there's that we all have networks of people around us that we trust for different things. And we kind of want to be a part of those networks. And I wrote here that we want to be building audiences, not just targeting buyers. So if that's the case, we want to earn the attention of those audiences. And I see three main ways to earn attention. And I'll run these by you. you. Maybe you have some others. One is cult of personality or celebrity. I call it the, the cat pee carpet test. If other people think it's interesting that your cat peed on the carpet, then you're a celebrity. And you, you have attention just because people think you're cool. You know, it's sort of the, I don't want to pick on the Kardashians too much, but it's the Kardashian thing. Another way is virality, which is pulling some type of stunt that, you know, for some reason you post something on Facebook and thousands of people share it for whatever reason, or you, you make a viral video and it gets shared. The challenge with virality is that it comes and goes. The third way is to earn attention is through topic authority and expertise and sharing your expertise. In other words, you find something unique that you or your business is very good at and you try to become the best in, well, if not the world, the, the best in your community or around that. And perhaps part of that is you become the best at sharing that content. Author Cal Newport, he wrote a book and I always love the title, Be So Good They Can't Ignore You. I'm fascinated by this notion of attention because I think attention spans are definitely diminishing. 
people are much more distracted than they used to be. I remember being on the web in the late 90s and people would bookmark your website. I'll be sure and check that site tomorrow. But the problem is that now they're on Facebook, they're getting text messages, they're, you're competing with baby pictures and to some extent Game of Thrones and people aren't coming back to your website. If so, they ever went there. Right. If they ever went there in the first place. And there's almost a billion websites today. That's right. <laughs> right. Not to find what you're for. So the conclusion I've drawn there is that you earn audiences through sustained attention in your area that you specialize in. And there's different ways to get attention. Let me just run through some of them and then we can talk about them. One of them, I, 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 put, I made them all the same. You'll, you'll get a sense of the pattern here. You, wanna be, you still want to be searchable. So, you know, that means that SEO and stuff like that still, still matters. You, you want people to, when they're searching for something that pertains to your stuff, you want them to find you. That might include things like peer review and third-party sites as well where you want to have a presence. Obviously, there's a little bit of a twist as we see the rise in voice search. The notion of search is, is transforming and, and will be more. You want to be followable. So uh, that means social media accounts, right? You want people to be able to find you and follow you. You want to be, and I think this might be the most important of all in my opinion, you want to be subscribable. As in so, ads? Subscribable as in I want to subscribe to your podcast, Colleen. Okay. Because I want to get it every time you put it out. So, so you know, so right. It could be a YouTube channel, it could yeah. be an email yeah, list. It could be yeah, Colleen's a podcaster, so I use oh, her as an example. Okay, thank She's, you. She's just That's got eight. Two subscribers. Yeah, <laughs> and you'll get a lot more, I'm sure. And, you know, part of that, obviously, is when you think about something like a podcast, the rudimentary thing is, oh, I record an audio file, I put it on my website. That's not subscribable. What's subscribable is being on iTunes and... Podbean, yeah, Twitter, Yeah, and you can speak more to that if people want to find out more about that. But for each type of media you produce, you want to be subscribable. And then there's the social part, which, and I have my own strong feelings about social media, which I get into a little more in the next session. But the way I think about social is you want to be accessible and relatable because a lot of people aren't accessible and relatable. Can I speak to yeah. that for just a second? Yeah. Because something is, I found very interesting. We've seen, you were mentioning, Ada, that Staples is collapsing at the brick and mortar. One of the early presence on websites through e-commerce was L.L. Bean. And 10 years ago, they opened a brick and mortar in Windsor, Connecticut, South Windsor, Connecticut. Now they just opened another retail, smaller boutique space. So I'm listening to you talk, and I'm thinking, they know where their community is. That's the demographic piece. And they're now making that presence that you just mentioned, which was accessible and reachable. Right. So they are making a Barnes and Noble side structure like they did in their first it at moving out of Freeport, but they so this next generation is apparently going to be boutiques that select right community levels. Yeah, I think so, and I think what's powerful about being accessible and relatable to your customers and your community that you're serving is that you have the power to make changes quickly based on their feedback. And that's very powerful to them, right? Because they can so, tell that you're listening. You're almost saying that those little retail footprints are like focus groups. Kind of, yeah. That, that, that companies are moving into much more of an, an iterative and testing type of mentality. And, and obviously, data is a big part of that too, which we haven't really talked about. But but we're able to measure and analyze all these things as well. And so I could probably add that to my list that you want to be be measurable in the sense that you want to have statistics that you can look at to see what's working and what's not, what people are responding to and, and what they're not, and trying to better understand where the demand for certain things really lies. And you might be evolving your business model as a result of that feedback. So let's let's get some responses to what I've said so far. What do you think? Questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, so I want to know how you define accessible. Accessible would be, first of all, you are available where your community is conversing. So I don't know. That probably varies for people in this room. 
For me, it's Twitter and LinkedIn and to a much lesser degree, Facebook, though we do have some interaction going on in a group and a couple of pages on Facebook. It means that I'll answer anyone's question who asks me a question. I'm not looking at how influential they are, who, whether they, what their clout score is or any of that crap. Like anyone who seems to have an investment in the topic, I'm gonna respond to them, try to be helpful to the extent that I can be, because I think that people respond better when they feel a connection to you and when they feel like they have a relationship of some kind with you. Because I think a lot of companies still, they don't have that type of connection with people. And, and even when, like if you ping a large company on social media, they might respond. So maybe they seem accessible, but they, did they really do anything about your feedback? Did they tell you like, oh, that's a really good idea. We're going to pass that along to our team or follow up with you later and say, we made a change. You know, I had an application called Newsblur, which is like a news reader. It's, there's still some news readers around that people, geeks like me use, like Feedly is another one. And Newsblur actually made a change to their product based on feedback that I left in their forum. And I was like, oh my God. And my feeling about them as a company obviously changes a lot then because it's like, wow, you're not only taking my feedback in, you're making a change as a result of that. Somewhere in the middle is like Southwest Airlines where I fly Southwest a lot. So they, they respond and they're like, like, they'll be like, oh, that's great feedback, but it doesn't, nothing changes. So it's nice of them that they said that and I appreciate that they listen, but it's not changing. And then another company, a luggage company that I had a problem with their luggage and they were, it took them two weeks to respond to my message on Twitter and I responded back saying you might want to check your Twitter a little more often than every two weeks. Like things are moving a little faster than that. So I think there's kind of a spectrum of accessibility, but the best accessibility is conversational, but also follow through where people can see how their ideas are impacting what you're doing. That's another thing. What what do you, sorry, I want to get to you in just a sec. What do you think of that? that I just was drowning under trying to answer everybody individually. So I stopped cold for everybody. And yeah. I think probably the better thing would be for me to do like little Facebook lives or little the mm-hmm. little Instagram videos and say, I've got a lot of comments such as because I just was drowning under all of the individual outreach for conversation. Yeah, and there are definitely things you can do to to deal with that. I mean those are good problems, but they are problems. Yeah, it was distracting um, from getting my business done or making yeah. money. <laughs> right. So, so for example, one thing, just a couple things there, and I'm sure you've thought of things like this, but one of my, one of my friends, he just did a a webinar series and you know how in most webinars, there's like 30 questions that never get answered at the end. So he picked like the most common, like 10 and he wrote up like, here's frequently asked questions from the, and he picked those, put it all up for, expose it for everyone to read and share. Right. So there's different ways you can think about that. Another interesting thing is polling people. So you know, getting, having them take, take some kind of a survey or poll okay. and then releasing the results of that. So, so listening doesn't always have to be one-on-one because sometimes that doesn't scale. <laughs> yeah. So, so sur- polls and surveys, I've been thinking about that. So I definitely want to do that. I'm going to action that. What was the thing you said right before that? Well, the webinar FAQ stuff, like frequently asked. I don't think I've taken them enough, so I... So, so just, you know, you wouldn't need a webinar to do it. You could just pick reader questions of the week, for example, and, and have a weekly roundup, or maybe it's once a month. The, you, you have to figure out the frequency that works for you. Yeah, I need you to know. do some, I was being and, I wasn't being sustainable before. So yeah, and, and you hit on a really important point because as we talk about this, when we, when we think about this sort of iterative notion of, obviously creating content is a big part of this, right? Because you can't reinforce your topic authority without creating some type of content. And I don't happen to think that social media in and of itself is enough. I think there needs to be some kind of deeper content. It might be blog posts, it might be podcasts, something. But whatever you're producing and including your interactions has to be sustainable for the long term. Because if you burn out, then then you're not effectively part a vibrant part of the community. You're a burnout. And that's that's not a value add for yourself or anybody else. You answered that because that was I was feeding off the person and you went right into it, my question was having to do is how do you deal with people wanting immediate spon- you know, responses? So one other really interesting thing that I'll share with you, the learning the, the traditional learning in this field has to do with buyer personas. 
and and mapping out buyer personas. So typically in a buying process for your business, there's one or two or three types of people that are most likely to, to buy your stuff. And so over time, you figure out who are these people? What do they care about? And then traditionally, you've talked about mapping content to those personas based on various phases in the cycle of readiness to to purchase. So for example, there does come a time when someone is ready to really evaluate what your services are. And you want to have how-to instructional videos on different aspects of that or, or guides to working with you or guides to participating in whatever it is that you do. Maybe it has client testimonials and customer stories, which are very, very powerful, obviously, if, if, if people have had good experiences working with you. I often believe that the heart of all that content is the customer case study, where you write a story about a customer or project from beginning to end, what they got out of it, what the results were, what the hard parts were even, right? And and you get their permission to publish that. That's gold. And, and that can become the foundation for all kinds of things because maybe they would, once you publish a case study, maybe you share it with media types who might be interested in interviews or maybe you do webinars. So that's the traditional notion of how to address this from a content perspective is, and when I said in the, in the title, we're all publishers, like reaching people with content. And a lot of that is about building trust. Content has a way of building trust if it's done in a transparent way. Part of it is that you're trying to help people without necessarily requiring them to buy anything from you. But the one thing that I think is really interesting is that a lot of times people don't even know their buyers. So the problem with the traditional model I described to you is that you're starting way too late at that point. Like you want to reach people just because you care about the same things. Like I remember last year I went to the, you guys know about the nerd conference that it's like a free tech conference at UMass. Last year, I went to a really great presentation on doing WordPress sites that was more like advanced stuff. And we were running on WordPress at the time. And I wasn't, we weren't thinking about a new WordPress provider, but I love this guy's presentation so much that I went up to him and we ended up having a pretty involved, we didn't end up like hiring this guy, but it came pretty close. And, and we weren't even buying at that time technically. But I just trusted and respected what he was saying enough about how what we could do with WordPress that we weren't doing that I wanted to work with him further. And so there's this notion that that you want to be putting out content that's not just branded content, right? But that just is more helpful content in your particular industry. So in, in the case of my website, Diginomica, we publish a lot of stuff, free content. You don't have to do anything to consume it. Just read it. And... A lot of it will be stuff we're learning on the ground about, you know, we just did a bunch of stuff on women in technology, for example, and what the issues are with, you know, why diversity at, at higher levels remains a problem and what to do about it and blah, blah, blah. You give that content away because you, you want to essentially reach people. It's not about, oh, buy something from us. It's here's something we're learning about that we want to share. Sometimes that's called thought leadership content. <laughs> But it's really all about establishing your expertise in something. So you're part of a community, but you're hopefully you're you have something to offer that community that's unique. And in the process of sharing content, you build that uniqueness. And what form that content takes is very personal and depends on your talents and time frames and all that other stuff. So I guess that was sort of the main final piece I wanted to share. There there could be a longer discussion around how you go about socializing that once you, because I think it's a three-step process. I think it's a identity slash business identity process of figuring out who you are in the world. Then it's a content production and creativity process. And then it's a social process. And what I think a lot of people are making the mistake is they're starting with social without looking at identity or content or expertise. They're just starting to, oh, I gotta be on Facebook because everyone tells me I gotta be on Facebook. And social is really the last step to me. Social is once you figure out all that other stuff, now you wanna start connecting with people. And ideally communities are not just online. Ideally they're also in person. So you're 
you're going to events, you're speaking at events, you're doing all that stuff to connect further with those people. And then the, the buying process emerges pretty organically from that. And, and certainly there are things you can do. We could talk more specifically around generating leads for marketing and sales and stuff. But it's pretty clear that marketing and sales have to undergo a pretty dramatic transformation, right? To meet the kind of economy I'm describing. And in a nutshell, what I would say is that marketing people have to become educators and salespeople have to become advisors. Instead of taking people out to golf courses like used to happen in my industry, now it's about coming to them with data that they don't have and saying, here's some stuff we learned about your business and your industry that you might not have. Can we share it with you? It's more about being trusted than it is about pushing product. So we have about five minutes. I'll turn it over to questions or comments of any kind. It sounds like the majority of what you just talked about has to do with business to consumer communications. It could be B2B. I mean, our industry is B2B, so all this... A lot of the research stemmed from B2B originally. So you feel the same pattern relates to B2B? Yeah, I mean, what you have to kind of do with this is look at your the purchasing process in your industry and figure out who's involved in the buying process and how it works and kind of work backwards from there and figure out how communities work in your, your industry. Like, so for example, in, in our B2B context, we're talking about bigger software decisions. And so it might be like a CIO would make the final decision with their budget, but that person's going to be talking with like a programming experts to say, Hey, what do you think of this software? They're going to be talking with security people. Is this software compliant? They're going to be talking with the business users to figure out will you even like this software. Do you care? You know, like if I buy this, will you actually use it? So there's all kinds of people around that that affect that decision. So we have to figure out who all those people are, and, and, and what they care about and find a way to reach those people. And in every industry, there's a some kind of buying pattern. I don't know if you have any comments on yours, but how it works in your industry. But. It's a similar circumstance, but what I'm looking at is, okay, does social media really impact the B2B buyer as much as it does on the business-to-consumer buyer? Right. And so, for example, in our industry, email is still a bit really big. Like oh, mine as well. a lot bigger than social. Absolutely. So now LinkedIn is somewhat important for some, yes. but, but in general, like a lot of our buyers aren't on social, but some of the influencers are that you want to reach. And that may be true in your industry as well. So it's something to check on because there's people that advise on buying and advise buyers in a lot of industries. So a lot of those people are pretty social. And, and you may want to reach them. But for buyers, a lot of times classic things like webinars, even even on the ground seminars and events, things, you know, when I talked about opt-in audiences, what I meant by that is people giving you data in exchange for value, right? So you might find that sign-up type content is very valuable for you to to then have the email addresses of people who are saying, yeah, I like your stuff. Can you, can you keep sending me certain things? Now they're expecting stuff from you. They're an email audience. Email still really puts butts in seats in a lot of industries, much more so than social. The, the only reason I mentioned social is part, partially because we're at a pod camp where social is a big theme and I wanted to make sure I addressed it. But also I do think social can set a nice tone in terms of, like I said, being accessible. Email isn't, the difference I see with email is it's not as interactive as it used to be. Like maybe it is for you, but I don't I don't get as many people asking questions by email as I used to. I tend to take to social channels when they ask questions these days. But but emails imp- really important for like updating people on events and newsletters and news in your industry. And and one terrific way of doing that is by curating content as well. So you don't always have to produce content yourself. Sometimes you could say. I'm going to share share with you a best of the week of links that I've seen in my industry and send those out to people. You want to build subscribers. So however those subscribers work for you is what you have to figure out. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I have one more question. I apologize. Um, no, no. In many businesses, web content blocked or severely limited because of security. Mm-hmm. Do you have any statistics or what's your experience with that? It really, it really varies on on the company in terms of 
firewall and stuff. I mean, I found that email newsletters generally get through, but sometimes there's a blocker there. But a lot of times email does get through. In a lot of com- in a lot of companies, Facebook is blocked, obviously, and so you have to take that into account as like your marketing vehicle. One thing I have noticed that worries me a little bit is that people are less willing to click on links for various reasons because there's been a lot more link fraud and exploitation, and you really want people to click on links because I'm a believer that you still want to have a a hub of content on your website. I mean, I I think the best thing to do is to sort of look at your web traffic stats and who's signing up for what and figure out like how best to reach them. But, but yeah, it can be an issue getting people at their corporate. Sometimes they'll give you your personal, their personal emails and that will work better. Like a, a lot of people maintain a Yahoo or a Gmail account or something where you can reach them outside of work stuff. And sometimes that works, but it can be a problem. I don't necessarily know the the perfect answer to it. Some of it is providing a bunch of different kinds of content and hopefully they'll reach you outside of work as well like ebooks, PDFs, can maybe even Kindle. Maybe maybe some of these folks read Kindle and they'll download something on there outside of work. So based on the stats on our web the company website that I work for, we're finding lower level people searching on their phones. Right. And then they may fill out a request for more information and we right. get an email automatically generated from the website but we can't even go straight to their website if we know what company they're working for because of the block on our computer system so we end up having mm. to go back to their websites on our phones yeah so that's kind of been an interesting barrier yeah and I think that's a real big reason why you have to have intimate knowledge of who your audience is and figure out if they if they like your stuff and see value in what you do, then you figure out how to communicate with them in a way that works. But it can be tough. It it is a problem solving situation. I mean, this is not when you look. For example, if you have an email newsletter, you look at it, you're like, God, all, so many people didn't even open this, right? Like, what's considered a successful email send is pretty low with open and click rates. So a lot of people aren't getting it. I think what you have to hope is that eventually what you're doing invokes enough passion in people that they're willing to overcome some obstacles to get the information that you're putting out there. But it is tougher than it used to be to bootstrap this kind of stuff because of that. I think it's tougher. So I don't have a silver bullet for you. It's just a little tough. That's actually getting tougher because of the uh, security issues. Yeah, it is. It is. But, you know, I, I think, do you have on the ground events that people go to? Not currently. Okay. Are there industry events that you don't put on that people go to? Uh, yes, mm-hmm. and but we're not presenting as subject matter experts. Which is something I think if I were, you, I'm, you, I want to look at that because that's a great example of starting to sort of break down the walls, barriers. You're up there on stage or you're co-presenting with a customer and start to build the relationships because in the end you need relationships to solve these problems. Any other comments or questions? Uh, building a audiences the first one C-A-T-P I didn't get that uh, sorry what was that building audiences yeah that why it matters or what it meant and, yeah. okay so so what I've what I've thought about and this has been through a, d- a debate I was having with Robert Rose over at the Content Marketing Institute which is an interesting resource around this stuff and they have a conference by the way that it's worth going to talk about he and I talk about the notion of building audiences of opt-in subscribers and within those audiences are buyers and future buyers but there's also a ton of people that may never buy from you that are still important and so it's really about realizing that you want to reach a lot of people, not just hone in on one type of individual. And this kind of gets back to your point, too, because sometimes you said like people who might be not the decision maker, but other people may be more accessible and they become important to reach them because they, they can bring stuff to the table of other people that are harder to reach, which is a classic in our industry. The real budget holders are very careful because they're getting hit on all the time, but you can reach people around them much more easily. So. Yeah, yeah. Cold, yeah, celebrity, celebrity, and celebrity celebrity and getting, getting yeah. atten- three, ways, three main ways of getting attention. Yeah. Virality, cult of personality, 
slash celebrity and and topic authority and expertise, yeah, to, which is the one that I'm advocating. Okay. Where, so those were the three. Now, I think it, a little bit of virality and cult personality is okay. It's not a bad thing to for people to find you relatable. Um, it's just that I, I look at it more like I want to earn attention through trust and expertise, and that's the way I want to do things. But that I'm not... There are a lot of businesses that don't think that way. So, one way or the other, attention has to be re- achieved. But I think the subscribable and followable pieces are really important now in terms of re reaching people because even if you have a good feeling about certain companies or certain resources, you might forget to go back. I mean, Right. I mean, I, I've been done that all the time now where I forget about certain websites and, and I'm, and then I, that's why I have a newsreader because I eventually, I remember to go subscribe to their feed so I can see all their stuff. But if I don't do that, I'm lost. And adding to that problem is, as, as you know, there used to be a long timeline between new ideas or new applications becoming part of the, in the language. Now it's hardly, can be measured in hours in some sense. It is. And you got to stay on top of that because you've gotta, you do not know what's going to click until maybe it's too late if you're not paying attention. Right. Well, I think I think like just the profound nature of what's happening with voice technology right now is a really good example of that. You know, um, uh, I've got Alexa at home and stuff and That's right. interacting with content on there. And I'm not doing purchases on there yet, but, you know, things change quickly. So. And, and you move into it without realizing it. That means that community you're talking about is doing the same thing. Right. And so you have to pay attention to that. Thanks for coming. Thank, Thank you for- so much, Gary. Very much.